Hey guys, Tom Davidson, Landon Hutchison, back with season two of Yard Work. Uh, today we have Jeremy Johnson, head coach of Razorback Baseball, uh, one of the top programs in the nation, certainly one of the top guys in this region. Uh, these guys are 2020 national champions. Uh, and then Jeremy, I'll kind of run through how poorly you guys have done over the years. I actually went back all the way to 2013 for this event. Uh, 2013 Final Four in the National Championship, 2014 and 15, the Elite Eight round in this event for the National Championship, 2016, you beat Midland and the Indian Bulls to win the National Championship that year, 2017, you beat Midland again, 2018, you beat the Bulls again, 2019, you actually weren't very good and lost in the round of 16 in a 12-11 game against uh, Canes Midwest. And then obviously this past year, um, 2020 national champions again, where I think we found a, a little um, routine you guys have of when you win, you just win big and then, uh, or you win by one. So everything was like a 10 run game or it was a, a one run game. And then this past year, you actually, uh, I think need to send us more money because you did play four games at victory field, uh, the triple a, uh, team here in Indianapolis. Uh, but thanks for coming on. I know we had to pull you out of the shower so you get cleaned up, but uh, <laughs> thanks for coming on again. This is a, a, an every year thing for you guys. So talk to us a little bit about that 2020 team. Uh, 2020 team was special. Uh, basically, it was a weird year, obviously. Um, our roster was larger than normal, which that's saying something because we carry a lot of guys. Uh, so we started off with probably close to 27, 28 guys. Um, and that was mostly because of the way the pitching had to work because everybody was coming back. So really we were kind of in a fall mentality of one to three inning stints starting out. So if we're going to go and you guys helped with that tremendously because we didn't get into having to win six and seven ball games in a weekend, yeah. we were starting out doing four and five, which is way more feasible. But even with four or five, you still had to get 10, 11, 12 arms. And really we found out real quick that, there were two or three guys that, yeah, they did their work and they were pretty close to speed. And then there were not so many guys that, and not all their fault. I mean, you know, this has been a crazy year and not everybody has their same resources. So, and they have different responsibilities. I and mean, we had some small town kids that honestly, they needed to help out around the house and business wise and everything else. So um, in the first two or three weeks, we actually probably lost a handful of guys because on top of getting more pitching, we couldn't just go out and find a ton of high-level POs just laying around. So you ended up taking two-way guys. Um, and some of those two-way guys, you know, it was very similar to a college situation. If they didn't like where they were at after two weeks, they were, and it was nothing negative. It was just like, well, coach, I just don't know if I'm going to fit in here that well. You know, so the interesting way the summer played out was really the I won't say the cream rose to the top because a couple guys who didn't make it are going to be really good college ball players, but the guys who wanted to be there did. And I think that's what showed up came the last two weeks, which is yeah. kind of our MO on that. Yeah. I know that that early summer period, um, we didn't start on time in a couple of States, but you know, in Ohio, we did start on time, Ohio, Tennessee, places like that, Michigan. And when we did start on time, we kind of preset some of those events where, we weren't allowed to do bracket play. So it was a set number of games. Uh, and that really helped with the pitching to get those guys going since they lost that high school season for sure. Yeah. And then there were still guys who were like, I need to throw more than this. And it's like, you don't really need to throw more than this right now. You know, it's going to be a ramp up period. You're, you know, it'll all work out. You just kind of got to see it through, but there's a lot of things that pull different guys. And we actually, one of our biggest guys we recruit against now are college leagues. Yeah, you know, there are a lot of college leagues that pull out high school seniors, you know, especially, well, really just everything, every position pitching too. So we kind of go up against those guys on being able to hold players too. How many of your guys were really affected with, you know, that extra year, I guess, that the next level guys got from this? Uh, I think it's going to trickle down. I think it's going to trickle down more to 22. Um, I'm seeing it more with my 22 guys having – uh, difficulty in just where to fit. I mean, the rosters are so huge um, at the college level. Um, and it's not a bad thing. I mean, I'm all for it. 
you know, the best, the best play, and then you'll find where you go, and then you'll go there, and you'll play there. You yeah. know, I don't think there's anything negative about it. You know, if you're afraid of competition, and I had this conversation with my, one of my outfielders this year. Um, he was going to an extremely high-level junior college, and he noticed that they just kept bringing in more and more at his position, and they were a lot of D1 fallbacks. And he was just like, I just don't know if I'm going to be able to play coach, you know, and his parents reached out to me and everything. I was like, well, what's your end game? Is you, do you want to be a professional baseball player? Or do you just want to go play somewhere for two to four years and go on with life? I go, there's no wrong answer. Just which one do you think? He goes, I think I can play pro ball. I'm like, then why would you not stay there? I was like, if you want to play pro ball, you can't ever be afraid of competition. Yeah. You know, I was like, you know, you're, if, if this is your option is, I don't think I can make it here. I go, you need to really think about what your, what your answer just was, you know, cause you need to find out as soon as possible where you're at and what your weaknesses are, you know, so you can get on top of it. You know, you can't run away from competition. You gotta, you gotta face that straight up. So uh, Jeremy, take us through a little bit of the, of the weekend that you had for the national championship this, this year. Oh man. Some of that's not fit for a uh, video, but, um, <laughs> You know, basically, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll walk you through your schedule here. On uh, Wednesday, <laughs> you guys were at Indiana West Lane against Precision Patriots, fourteen to one game. Okay, very beautiful place. I don't think I'd ever played at Indiana West Lane. No, it's. Um, a, I mean, they just redid that facility to turf it. Uh, yeah. Before that, this past year. And not even just the field, but just the just the campus is really nice. Um, yeah. You know, it's a quaint little drive out there. Um, you know, quaint's one way to put it. Yeah, yeah. You got to pee before you leave because um, there isn't much out there. Uh, but um, good, solid ball game. We kind of got off to a slow start, if I remember right. I think we well, first or second inning we was like one nothing, and I think we put up a ten spot or something. But uh, actually, Archer, one of our corner infielders, hit a ball on the roof of left center field. You know, we were joking that I was like, you know, I was like, I told the coach afterwards, I go, I go, have you ever seen that before? He's like, yeah, I think we've had that a couple of times. I go, well, for aesthetics, I go, you should really go down and measure that out, like on Google Maps or something and hang a sign just on the top yeah. of that. So I was like, it'd be kind of cool. So when you hit it up there, you kind of have an idea how far it is, you That's know, right. but he absolutely crushed one. But so that, was, uh, that was Wednesday, that was one of those. You either score a ton or you win by one kind of games. On uh, Thursday, you played the Suburban Columbus Trappers, a 4-3 game, which they always play pretty well when they play in this event. Yeah, they're the Scrappers, right? That uh, is a very, very fitting term because that game frustrated the hell out of me. Because <laughs> I didn't – and they were a good, solid team. They had a good, solid arm. But it was like it felt like an eight-three ball game, and then and I told our guys, "Well, like, here we go. We're in the sixth and seventh inning of a one-run ball game." I was like, "And there's a lot of things that can change in a one-run ball game. I mean, it's just, you know, a bad hop, which I'm not thinking we might even been on turf there, but, um, you know, zone gets a little different in the sixth and seventh inning. I was like, you know, there's just could we possibly get a couple more runs? And we couldn't. To their credit, they they pitched well. They had a couple guys I think throw that game, and they competed." Yeah. They competed really well. I think they had a pretty good shortstop, if I remember right. Um, we just couldn't get a hit when we needed a hit, but they did a great job. That was definitely not a comfortable game. Um, it kind of was reminiscent of the game we did drop a couple years back to that Wisconsin team that almost knocked us completely out. I think that was wasn't that 16 or 18, maybe 18. Yeah, that might have been when I was standing behind the plate. Uh I couldn't move as you guys were rallying, rallying around there. Yeah. So well, this game was at Chittard, so you were on turf there as well. And then your last pool play game against Top Pick Athletics was at the at Victory Field, a 13-0 game. Obviously, not a whole lot to cover there. But, you know, the first game at Victory Field, I knew we wanted to get you guys over there uh, because of the history and, and how well you guys have done in the past. How did you guys kind of get suited up for that game at, at Victory? Because it's not – it's not like going to, you know, Butler or even Indiana Westland or places like that where they're college venues. It's just, it's different when you get there. Oh, yeah, it was really cool. I mean, now the thing is, you know, and I always shoot straight Tom, it would have, in any other year, it would have been a, it probably would have been significantly better 
but the nicer the place you went this year, the more rules you had. Yeah. <laughs> so it kind of, you know, it was a little bit of a buzzkill, you know. So that was a 13-0 game. And then you start going into pool play or bracket play. You guys were a seven seed. Uh, I know Saturday you played at Chittard both games. You won a 9-0 game and then an 11-1 game. Went on to uh, Sunday in all three games at Victory Field again where you had Chi-Town Cream, Indiana Nitro, and then KBC Prime. So it's not like you were just seeing nobody. That first game, Chi-Town Cream is a 1-0 game. Uh, Indiana Nitro, then it turned into the 10-1s and 10-0s. I know KBC ran out of pitching uh, towards the end, but you know, that's that benefit of having 52 guys on your roster like you guys carried. Not quite 52, but uh, um, I'll tell you, the Chi-Town Cream game, we played them the week before at that perfect game World Series down in Hoover, Alabama, and it was a 1-0 ball game, 1-0 or 2-0, 2-1 ball game, maybe 2-1. But um, we faced the same pitcher again, that lefty. And, um, you know, when he came out of the game, they put in, I don't remember what the kid's name was, who's a right-hander. He faced two hitters, and it was back-to-back -back doubles. We scored our run, then they changed it out, and we didn't touch that next guy, and that's how the game ended. And, uh, you know, the Bergman kid who we threw, Max Bergman, um, who was with me for two years, he was kind of like our self-anointed uh, brain man of st statistics. Um, he would map all the pitching. I mean, he, he really did a great job. I mean, he was one of the – He's one of the guys I actually trusted what he said most of the time. Every once in a while, I had to tell him that he wasn't a coach. But, um, you know, he did a great job. But he absolutely dealt that game. I mean, he did a great job for sure. He definitely was the guy we needed in that game. And then KBC, we threw, if I remember correctly, Dotson, Brandon Dotson, um, who's at Wabash Valley now. Uh, outstanding kid. I mean, the more I hung out with Dotson, the more I liked him. I was – he was, he was like the most laid back competitive guy I've probably ever came across. I mean, just to sit around and talk with him, not a care in the world, but when he steps on the mound, I mean, there's very few guys that match his intensity and his desire to win. And he really, really knows how to compete. He's going to be a really good college arm. And I think he'll have a chance to play pro ball if everything, you know, lands right. And then the Baca kid, uh, finals that one was just a little that was nice that made that made the finals a little bit more enjoyable um you know extremely effortless arm you know kind of well, I won't say effortless but smooth um you know being able to sit there 90 94 you know on the last game on Sunday but I think I told Hutch this over the phone when we were when you were rescheduling me because you had a better offer um that um you know <laughs> That yeah, um, do what? Had to get my hair cut. And yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did get your hair did and all that. But uh, you know, when he was throwing, you know, our guys, our confidence level was through the roof. Now the thing is, though, and that whole day was kind of touch and go. And I'll give it to you guys and to uh, you know the um, club up there. They did a great job of getting those games in because realistically on any other year, we would have been done, washed out, not anybody. I mean, you know, yeah. usually if three birds fly over and pee, you're pretty much canceled. Yeah, they, they babied that. I mean, it's, when you look at the field at victory, it, it deserves to get baby. Oh yeah. Uh, they, I mean, when we hosted there, you know, seven, eight years ago when we were really starting these national championships, I mean, we couldn't even go on the field like on the dirt with to hand out medals and trophies when we did all that kind of stuff. We had, they like pushed us to the warning track. They wouldn't let us touch a blade of grass. It was like, we were, you know, we had fire in our hands. Yeah. So when we were there in 2012, cause we were there in 2012. Yeah. You didn't go back one extra year. You yeah, I, I don't have that on our, our <laughs> <year. laughs> but uh, yeah, we were there. That's the year uh, we played, uh, the Canadian team, I think. Toronto Mets, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Well, give us a rundown on these guys that were on the roster this past year and maybe where they're at now. Okay, we'll just go around the infield. Um, I'm, I'm going to definitely miss somebody. Uh, Grant Nip behind the plate. Definitely probably our captain-ish kind of guy. Outstanding catch-and-throw guy. 
um, probably going to be one of our top catchers we ever had. Um, and then we, he was complimented by Hunter Thomas, who's at Ren Lake. Extremely effective catcher. He was probably actually a better percentage-wise throw, catch and throw, throw guys out than Nip, but Nip's um, – nobody really ran on Nip at all. So, you know, he didn't have quite as many opportunities. But yeah. um, Thomas probably backpicked five or six kids this summer. And I can say that uh, my outstanding coaching abilities did not call any of them. I didn't even – we have a uh, – sign for backpicking but we almost never use it we just leave it up to those guys so yeah he backpicked five or six guys and I mean and it was most time it wasn't even close they do a good job with that um and then um as far as uh our number three catcher he was kind of a do-it-all guy and he had to leave early which was Caleb Corbett out of well he's going to University of Louisville now we used him more as an arm and a hitter but he did catch some um, for us but yeah I mean by far if you went three deep catching wise those are our three best catching team we've probably ever had I mean those guys were very 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 good we didn't have to really worry about running too much um, as far as first base we had Tate Van Hooser who's actually coming back for his third year this year um, we had Archer who is at John a, John a. Logan um, Joel I always want to call him Phil because I've been around long enough that I've tried to recruit his brother too. So I, it got to like weeks five before I started calling him Joe. So I usually just called him Archer because I always called him Phil, which is his brother's name. But uh, big guy. I mean, he was one of those, you know, you know, just looks like he should be walking around the beach kind of guy. But uh, very good hitter, outstanding kid. Um, surprisingly effective arm. He could, he could pitch a little bit. He had some fun. He threw a, he also threw against KBC. I think the last two or th two and a third inning um, wasn't overly high velo, probably low to mid eighties, but he had a good 12, six breaking ball. And just the way he delivers, it's kind of hard to pick up um, on the corners as well. We had uh, Parker Estes, who's at Murray state was one of our kind of middle of the order hitters somewhere in that five, six, seven area. Great kid. Um, dugout guy. Everybody loved Parker. Um, Parker's going to, if after a great playing career, he's going to be an outstanding wingman for everybody he's ever friends with. Um, and also, Estes was probably our sneaky arm find of the summer. Um, third weekend, I guess, we needed an arm, and he's like, well, I pitch. And I was like, you pitch? He's like, yeah. He's like, I've thrown like 40 innings every year, coach. So we put him on the mound. I don't think he gave up an earned, an earned run all summer. I mean, I volunteered to do that when I played travel ball, but it was, you know, 48 mile an hour knuckleball, and that was it. Yeah, he didn't, I mean, he was 82, 85, you know, but yeah, I mean, but he was also a guy who just, when he got on the mound, he just honestly believed he was the baddest SOB on the man. You know, it was fun to watch because, and he had his Ephus pitch too, that, you know, he'd throw 84, 85, maybe pop an 86, and then flip one off of his wrist at about, you know, the only reason it got there is because, you know, I mean, it, it probably, it was almost an illegal softball pitch. <laughs> you know? So, you know, and realistically at times, I, you know, he'd always ask, can I throw that pitch today? And I'm like, you know, it's a, it's a plus five, minus five type thing. If we're up five or down five. Yeah. Really, if we're down five, don't throw it because it's probably just going to piss me off. But if we're up five, go ahead, you know, but, um, and then in the middle, our, our middle, which actually one of our starting third basemen came from our middle was Simon Sherry, who's at the University of Evansville, and then Cooper Trinkle, who is at uh, Wabash Valley, and then Leighton Keller, who's a three-year guy from me, who's at Missouri St. Luke, if I remember right. Yeah, that's it. Um, Cooper kind of won the sh uh, shortstop job, not really because he was necessarily just head and shoulders the best shortstop. You know, hopefully Cooper doesn't get mad at me for saying that. But it was the best infield. Um, Simon was an outstanding defensive player, and he actually ended up in our top five in hitting. He was kind of off to a slow start, but he finished really strong. Extremely high contact kid. But defensively, on the right side of the infield, he was an, he was shut down. Um, Cooper did a great job at shortstop. Um, you know, he was, you know, he always kind of reminded me of Johnny off of uh, uh, Friday Kid. Kind of looks like him, you know. 
got a similar attitude, nice guy. But if you don't know him, you probably wouldn't necessarily always like him because he plays with a pretty significant chip on his shoulder, which I don't really care. Um, and then Leighton Keller was our um, third baseman because he was one of our top players as far as on the base pass, uh, team captain type guy, hit over 400 for the summer, you know, could flat field it. But, you know, so he was the guy that basically had to be the biggest team player because he was definitely good enough to play shortstop. They all three were. So for them to accept what basically we decided we want to do and to play at such a high level, because our defensive, I looked this number up, so I wasn't, I'm not quite this big of a stack geek, but our fielding percentage for the summer was 96-7 as a team. And we're pretty hardcore on our um, statistics. I don't usually cut those guys any slack. So defensively, we were very, very good, you know, which gave our pitchers a lot of confidence to fill up the strike zone because they knew they'd go get it. Um, Outfield-wise, we had Isaac Humphrey, who went to the University of Louisville. Um, like Caleb, he had to leave early, so he wasn't there the last weekend. Um, Nathan Waldridge was probably one of our uh, nice success stories coming in. He was a high-level left-handed arm. He was originally committed to go to Middle Tennessee State and just a freak athlete. He can throw 90 from the outfield, runs a 6'7", six, 6'8". Six, um, got hurt arm-wise. So he was coming back and got started late. So he never threw for us. But when Isaac ended up going to Louisville, he kind of stepped in and just took off. He became basically our everyday right fielder um, and really added a lot. Um, he's got some pretty significant power. So he ended up hitting probably low to mid 300s that last three weekends. But he definitely filled a hole for us. Um, we had whole guard out in the left who's at Wabash Valley now. One of the absolute nicest kids you're going to ever meet. I mean, I would leave my daughter with him and I would just not even worry about it because he's just character wise. I mean, I, his parents should write a book, but um, can flat play. He can run too. He hits for average. He's going to be a really good ball player. Um, you know, our team was probably good for him a little bit because it got him a little bit out of his comfort zone before he got to Wabash because he was a, you know, he was, you know, he was so good. He squeaked when he walked. I mean, he squeaked clean. So, you know, but uh, he was, he's a great kid. But like I said, I'm probably missing a few guys. Oh, Wimber. I can't, I can't believe I forgot Wimber. Um, Nick Wimber, Ren Lake, our leadoff hitter, played out Bill Forrest. Um, played center field, basically took over center field when Isaac left. Um, outstanding guy, another guy I could definitely leave my daughter with. Um, great teammate. I mean, if you ever needed to hit, go with Wimber because Wimber hit probably three times a day. Um, yeah. You know, uh, he was great with our younger guys too. Like my son was there this year a lot. Well, he's there every year. But all of our assistants boys were there. He's really good with uh, helping those guys out, you know. As a whole, most of the guys on the team are, but Wimber, Wimber's just a really, really good kid. And he was another, I think he was a two and a half, maybe three year guy. Um, I always remember Wimber because when we had that incident a couple years ago at the beef over 80s there in Louisville, where half our team was involved in a crossfire, you yeah. know, Wimber was the one that was probably closest to it all. So yeah, he's a good, he's a good dude. I, I can't believe he ended up at Wren Lake because if anybody's been to Wren Lake, all you hear there, all, all day, every day is gunfire. So it's kind of ironic that after that, he ended up at Ren Lake. Yeah, that's the, the first place I got recruited was Ren Lake. So real yeah. quick, run down the, your pitching staff, just names, and, and if they're committed, where they're going. Okay. Uh, Bergman, he's at Cincinnati. Um, Dotson, he's at Wabash Valley. Bryant Miles, he was another um, guy that he was supposed to play last fall, or the fall before, I guess, got hurt. And texted me over the winter and was like, I just want to play coach. And I was like, well, I never even got a chance to see a pitch. So I don't know where you're going to fit. He's like, I just want to be there. I'm like, so I called a couple guys and they're like, yeah, you know, he's, he's all right. He can do it. You know, so we picked him up. He ended up throwing, uh, his ERA for the summer was one, three, one. I mean, he did a great job, but I mean, he sat 80, 83, so he could flat hit. I mean, he looks like he's about 32 years old right now, but you know, he's, outstanding kid he can he really compete 
understands the concept of pitching, changing speeds and all that, and understanding also that when you have as good a defense as we had, you just need to keep the barrel off the bat, not necessarily the whole bat. So he didn't have a ton of strikeouts, but he didn't he didn't walk anybody either. Um, Estes is at Murray State. He's going to be a hitter there. I don't think uh, Dan's probably going to put him on the mound. Archer is at Logan. He may do both there. Um, I haven't talked to Joe to find out exactly on that. Hey, Newkirk went to Wabash Valley, lefty. Um, started off a little slow for us, finished extremely strong. Um, he was a guy that, honestly, with everything we had, he was a guy that could have said, you know what, Coach, this isn't for me. To his credit, he stuck it out and became an absolute guy for us by the end of the summer, um, you know, which I'm really, really happy to see, especially with where he was going. You know, um, he didn't blink once. You know, he started off with one bad outing, but every after, after every outing after that, he got better and better and better. And by the end of the summer, he was almost unhittable. Uh, Childress is at Albany Central. You're probably picking up a pretty good team here. We're, we have a lot of Juco guys. Um, Quick is at the University of Southern Indiana. He did a good job for us, but he got kind of banged up there at the end of the year. Um, he's going to be a good lesson for Tracy and those guys. Uh, Corey Burns is just committed. He was at Southeastern Illinois, and now he's just committed to go to K-Dub. So he's going to be over there with Lil Pop. He's another kid that he's a shorter, you know, that's your kid, but he can, he can throw it. He can be up to 88. He's got a good breaking ball. And he's another guy that absolutely thinks he's as good as anybody on the face of the earth. Um, so he's, he's a great reliever. Um, and he can probably become a pretty good starter, too. Uh, let's see here. Euling was with us, but he was coming back from an injury. Jacob, who's at Ren Lake. So he only threw it for us a couple times. Um, it was his third year, though. Great kid. He just was coming back from an arm injury, so he didn't get to throw that much. Nick Compton was with us, who's at Wren Lake. Three sports superstar at, um, you go to Trico? So you went to a smaller school. I can't remember exactly off the top of my head. But he was another kid that actually, as the summer went on and everybody got, and got their feet under him and got in better shape, he became a pretty good arm for us down. Because he could run it up to 86, 88. Um, outstanding kid, athlete, all the way across the board. Uh, Skylar Brown was another lefty we had. Um, he had a he had an up and down summer for us um, oh. out of Murray. Uh, well, he's from the Murray, Kentucky area. He actually played at IMG this past year, um, and he's down at Florida Gulf Coast, if I remember right. But uh, great kid. At first, he's one of those guys you didn't know how it was going to work out. By the end of the summer, I. I would go to bat for that kid any time. He's a, he's a good kid. And he was another guy that, honestly, he, he comes from very high stock. So for him to struggle and stick it out, I think spoke a lot of his character. So Nice. I have a quick question, last one, about your – you're talking about character a lot. We've noticed that throughout the years with your players. I mean, we don't see too many of them getting ejected or anything like that or having to give any suspensions. So – how do you go through and make sure that they're, you know, a, a Razorback type type player? Because every single one of these kids seem gritty, and you don't hear too many bad things about them. So, what's your process with that? I don't really know, um, man. Lanny, you always ask those deep, thought-provoking questions. You couldn't let me, you know, we talked on the phone two days ago. You couldn't say, you know, what I'm going to ask you this <laughs> deep, thought-provoking question, and you're going to have to answer it in ten seconds. Um, I mean, I do background, the say background check, but it's not horrible. Basically, I reach out to the guys. I, t I talk to everybody before we pick them up. And I try to talk to them and just kind of figure out the biggest thing is that they really want to be here. You know, got, you know it's, it's relationship-based. So if you really want to play for us, you're going to probably have a better tendency to want to buy into how we do things. If you're just really good and you're just kind of like, yeah, I'll play for you because I sat here on the phone and kissed your ass, I don't really do that at all anymore because at the end of the day, there's always another player. And in a six to seven week stint, it's not always even the best players that have the best summer. So you got to find guys who want to do something with everything they have for six to seven weeks and honestly aren't so full of themselves that they can't understand the concept of a team mm -hmm. because that's all it comes down to. 
you know, and the thing I always tell our guys too is we've had some great summers, but this should not be the highlight of your life. I don't want it to be. I want it to be something you can look back on and go, yeah, that, that was fun. Coach Johnson's team was a lot of fun, you know, but I'm not into the fact that, you know, it's not a win at all cost, but trust me, we're not there just to show up, you know. Um, I think it's my responsibility to help keep these guys healthy and, but help them learn how to compete because in our travel ball world, man, we, Twitter is full of all kinds of concepts and opinions and honestly negativity and everything like that. And trust me, I'm not all, you know, positive, you know, I've had some meltdowns at the hotels and some of the Airbnbs and places we've stayed that have become legendary. But, um, you know, I look for guys who want to be there, honestly, you know, and it's, and I've learned that from guys like you Landon and every other college coach is because at the end of the day, the longer you coach, the more you realize it's, it's like being married. It's a heck of a lot fun or more fun to wake up to your wife and she's happy to be there. Then every day you're trying to re-recruit her to stick around for another day. You know, so, I mean, so you just, you just try to find guys who share your mentality and that want to be there. And then they'll buy into each other because everybody kind of knows that nobody's bigger than everybody else. And they know that. And I, and part of that comes from the coaching staff. Coach Davis does an outstanding job with this. He is probably the single handedly most um, brutally honest slash sarcastic guy I've ever met but at the same time I mean he will destroy these guys I mean he actually kind of looks for the silver spoon guys early and then just goes to town it's not anything horrible but he'll he'll call a spade a spade and you know those guys have to kind of fall in line because and the other guys kind of appreciate it because at the end of the day there's no favorite you know my favorite guys are the nine guys who help us win the day they're on the field that's my favorite guy you know, and my other favorite guy is the guy who can come in and get me out of a jam. My other favorite guy is when another guy screws up, I can put that guy in and he can save the day. Those are all my favorite guys, you know. Um, so from that standpoint, I'm looking for guys who buy into our program. And I'll be honest, in this day and age, that's a little harder to do because there's a lot of competition out there. And we don't have swag packages that meet up with these other guys. I mean, our swag is not real swaggy, you know? <laughs> I mean, you know, you can look out on our, when we have bases loaded, we probably have four different helmets on the bases, but yet we can still win. It's, a, I almost said the F word. It's a crazy idea, <laughs> you know? The, the helmets don't let, don't help you win. It's crazy. All these parents have been spending thousands of dollars. Do what? So you need a bus or a van next. Well, before we let you go, what's uh, 2020 overall record from the year? Oh, it was just an, it was just a year. It was 24 and three. Um, you know, a year. yeah, it, it was just a shade above average. Um, right, man. Well, but, I appreciate you coming on with us. I know we'll see you back here again next year. Uh, we're going to do a, a mandate on shaving completely before you come on the next show. See what we can do for you. I think I might let it grow all the way out for you. <laughs> all right, man. We'll see you. All right. Later.